Welcome everyone to our service today, to, uh, to those of you here, to those on uh, video and uh, those listening on the CDs as well. It is Sunday, it is a beautiful day. Praise and worship of the living God and these great words of Psalm 95 form our call to worship today. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool for he is holy. And we begin our praise today with words from that Psalm, Psalm 99, the first five verses. Uh, the Lord reigns from his throne on high. Let all the nations quake. If you're able, please stand and we will say these words together in praise of our God. The Lord reigns from his throne on high. Let all the nations quake. He sits between the cherubim, so let the whole earth shake. Great is the Lord on Zion Hill, exalted over all. Upon his great and holy name, let all the nations call. The king loves truth and equity established by his might. In Jacob you have done for us all that is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God with us. Let all the world abroad before his footstool worship him, for holy is the Lord. So we pray together to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we do bow before you this morning. You are the holy God, as we have declared in our praise. You and you only, O Lord, perfect in holiness, in purity, in goodness, in righteousness. And Lord, even our understanding of these conceptions of, of goodness and truth and righteousness comes from you, from your being, and from your ways, O Lord. So we bow before you in humility uh, at your greatness, O Lord, uh, and marvel afresh at the grace of the gospel that one so great and so good and so pure and so holy as you would take to do with the likes of us who by nature are sinners and who by choice had turned away from you. And yet, O God, we are here today because of that great gospel truth that your grace is greater than all of our sin. And so we praise you and thank you for such a great salvation as you have revealed in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King and Head of the Church, who came and who lived and who died, who rose again and who ascended into heaven and who reigns forevermore. And we are here uh, drawn by the love of Christ, O Lord, here to bow in uh, reverence and in adoration towards you, O Lord. Uh, for you have done this. You have done this, O Lord. The, the gospel is what you have done. The cross uh, that we hold so dear is what you have done for us and for our salvation. So we praise you. We thank you. We bless you this morning, O Lord, acknowledging that we are undeserving recipients and yet grateful all the same for your goodness towards us. And we do come, Lord, mindful of our shortcomings recognizing that even, even since we found faith in Christ and salvation uh, thereby, uh, we continue to yield to temptation. We do sin, O oh Lord, in thought and in word and in deed. So forgive us, we pray, and may our repentance not be routine, but may it be real as we seek to turn deliberately, uh, willingly, from all the sin that hinders us and holds us back in our lives of devotion and service to you. Help us in this, O oh Lord, we pray. And as we ask that, we thank you for your indwelling Spirit, who does indeed come to sanctify us and to lead us in your ways of righteousness. So draw near and bless us, O oh Lord, we pray. We, we bring our offerings to you this day as a token of our love and our adoration and thankfulness towards you. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would draw near and be very, uh, make your presence very real amongst us today, O oh Lord, that we might be blessed to be here, blessed by you, the living God. So hear our prayer. We offer it through Jesus Christ, our glorious Lord and King. Amen. Now, last week, 
at this point in the service, you remember, we were uh, talking about one of the, the heroes of the faith the, of the Scottish Reformation, Patrick Hamilton. And it's good for us to, uh, to know about those who have gone before us and, and pr provided a good example of uh, faithfulness to God. And so today, the character I've chosen to say a bit about is uh, maybe not just one of the best known Christians of all, but he, he maybe deserves to be. Uh, his name is George Muller, although in the early part of his life when he started off it was Georg uh, with a hard G, Georg Muller, and no E on the end. Uh, and uh, I've put there that he was the robber of the cruel streets. And that's because of uh, the obituary that appeared in the Daily Telegraph on the 11th of March, 1898, when Muller died. And the obituary said this, the far-reaching effects of his labors can never be approximately gauged or estimated. He robbed the cruel streets of thousands of victims, the jails of thousands of felons, the workhouses of thousands of helpless waifs. And he did it all, to use his own words, with the sword of the Spirit. And, and, and you understand, don't you, that he wasn't going into the jail and, and grabbing all these people and pulling them out. You know, he, he, was, he was preventing them from ending up there in the first place because of his work and because of the conviction that drove him in all of that work which came from the Lord. He was born, as you see there, 1805, a long time ago. And unlike Patrick Hamilton, who didn't live to even be 25, this guy lived a long life, lived to be 92. Um, but his, he, he was born into... Uh, a pretty well-to-do and respectable family in Prussia, which is now Germany. His father encouraged the young Georg, and the, the German origin explains the, the pronunciation, uh, to, to pursue a career in the church. Uh, and that wasn't, uh, that wasn't because of any uh, spiritual or, or uh, faith convictions at all. It was because Herr Müller Sr. figured that a career in the church would be quite stable and provide a good income uh, so that George could look after himself and his father in his father's good age, you see. Uh, you don't hear so, so much today about people going into the ministry for the money. Uh, it must be sad. But, but that was the way it was uh, back then. But Müller rebelled. Uh, and he had already embarked upon a, a kind of a playboy lifestyle. Uh, and as he grew through his teenage years and into his 20s, he prioritized drunkenness and women uh, and uh, wrong kind of relationships. But of course, found as so many do, that when you pursue pleasure in all of these things, it's always just out of reach and you never quite find what you're looking for. And he ended up in jail. Uh, because of unpaid debts that he had uh, racked up during his playboy lifestyle. Uh, and that was a wake-up call in a way, although it took him quite a long time to wake up. Uh, but it was, his, his life was to change suddenly through, get this, through being invited to a prayer meeting. See, sometimes uh, evangelism and sometimes gospel work is simpler than we maybe actually think. He, some, somebody invited him to a prayer meeting. It was, uh, it was now 1825, and Muller and the friend uh, arrived at the home of the Wagner family um, and in Germany, and he was bowled over by the warmth of the people, by their welcome of him, and found himself strangely enjoying this evening of worship, of Bible, of prayer, and of fellowship. How strange that the person that couldn't find uh, pleasure and joy in drink, in money, and in women now found it through prayer and through worship and through uh, Scripture and so on. And, and so he was, he was converted as a result of all of that, and uh, very, very firmly, very soundly, and very, very much an overnight turnaround, a bit of a Damascus Road kind of a thing. And uh, he, he soon felt called to Christian work. And his conviction was he wanted to, to be involved in reach out work to the Jewish people to help them understand uh, who the Messiah really was, that Jesus was the Messiah. But that wasn't the way that things opened up for him. And he ended up moving to England. So that's the next major part of his life. He moves to England, um, to, to London initially, uh, but then the city that he would most strongly be associated with, which is Bristol. And he knew he didn't get there because one of the things he'd neglected to do during his playboy lifestyle was uh, to do his national military service. Uh, he, had, uh, he had skipped that, uh, and so he had difficulty getting out of the country, and he was convinced he was to go to England, and he tried everything he could think of to get out of doing this military service belatedly, and uh, nothing worked, and nothing worked, so grudgingly he ended up attending for the, for the enrollment, and lo and behold, he failed the medical. So he didn't need to go to all that trouble anyway to, uh, to try to avoid it. Uh, God's hand
and was in all of this, and he was to go to England right enough. So he gets to England, and um, he, um, he, he gets there, and having begun at London, he finds himself at Tainmouth in Devon, and he worked there as a preacher and a minister very effectively, and the congregation he was working in grew uh, very, very definitely, uh, and so did his affections when he met a woman called Mary Groves. And so he and Mary were married, uh, and they, they decided, and this is one of the really important things in understanding George Muller's life, they decided together upon a particular principle that they would um, run by, and they did indeed stick by this for the rest of their lives, and that is that in the Lord's work, they would never ask anybody for money or for support. They would never have got anywhere on God TV, would they, uh, really? Uh, but that was their policy. They would never, ever ask anybody for money or for support. They would only ever make their needs known to the Lord directly through prayer and trust the Lord to supply their needs. And that didn't always pr pr produce a, an easy life for them, of course, and many times they had spent their last penny before the next one came in. But uh, nevertheless, uh, that was the, the policy, and they found that the Lord did provide. So in 1832, the, they moved to Bristol, and they arrived there at a time of social upheaval and increasing poverty, and Muller is especially struck by the plight of orphans in Bristol. He went there to be a preacher, really, but then became increasingly convinced that the Lord wanted him to be involved in seeking to uh, alleviate the suffering and the poverty of these um, orphans. So, um, he, um, they maintained the principle that they would never ask anybody for anything, only the Lord, and they embark upon this quest to find a property to open up an orphanage uh, for the children, and the time they managed to do so in a residential street, and uh, they managed to get everything, everything was supplied uh, by the Lord for the work. Such, were, such was the nature of the whole thing, of course, that the, the neighbors uh, weren't all that pleased. Uh, noise levels obviously increased dramatically, and uh, with 150 extra residents, drains tended to overflow and, uh, and things like that. So it was difficult. But uh, yeah, Muller began to dream of, of better things, uh, and uh, they prayed, and they prayed, uh, and uh, they, they, needed, they needed to raise 10,000 pounds to provide a, a suitable, large um, separate a, a suitable large uh, property in a, in a more remote venue that wouldn't annoy neighbors in a, in a residential street and so on. It was going to cost, that, that was an astronomical sum, 10,000 pounds in these days. The first thousand was received, and then an architect heard about the project, and he decided to offer his services for free, and then Muller heard about a suitable site, and when the owner of the land heard about the nature of the work that Muller wanted to do, he dropped the asking price by 50%. So everything was uh, moving forward wonderfully towards this project of the, of the orphanage. And uh, well, that, that was the first one, and then there was the second and third and the fourth, and, and so the work went on. It's estimated that Muller, having never ever asked anyone for anything and only trusted in the Lord to provide, he spent something in the region of 100 million pounds by today's standards, by today's money, 100 million pounds just through the Lord's provision uh, for the care of these children. <clears throat> but it wasn't always easy. You know, there's a, there's a great story of one day when uh, uh, he's got an orphanage full of children and they all come down for breakfast uh, in, the, uh, in the morning and Muller knows there's no food in the kitchen uh, and they're all sitting there and, and Muller says grace and says for what the Lord is about to pro <laughs> provide, please, Lord, um, may we be truly thankful. And then there's a knock on the door and a baker says, I don't know, but I couldn't sleep last night and at two o'clock in the morning, something told me to get up and bake some bread for Mr. Muller. And, and that, was the, that was the way their lives went, uh, and the Lord really provided in wonderful ways. It wasn't always easy, though. Muller did have personal difficulties. He and Mary lost some of their children, and then in 1870, Mary died as well, leaving Georgia a widower. Uh, he himself preached at her funeral, which was quite bold, but wait till you hear this. He, um, he, he was a great believer, and he approved the sovereignty of God and the provision of God in our lives he preached at a funeral. He took as his text, Psalm 119, verse 6 to 8, Thou art good and doeth good. You are good and do good. And his three points were, number one, God is good and did good in giving her to me. Number two, God is good and did good in leaving her so long with me. 
And you can maybe see what number three is going to be. God is good and did good in taking her from me. Now, that really is faith and trust in the providence of God, isn't it? And uh, he, did, he did go on to remarry, eventually a governess called Susanna, and they traveled the world. Thereafter, Muller speaking about the work, and he didn't ever retire from it, but he died in harness, 10th of March, 1898. The streets of Bristol had never seen anything like his funeral, and tens of thousands uh, maybe, maybe some of those who had been orphans themselves and would have been the ones in jail and in all that trouble if it weren't for Mr. Mueller and his gospel conviction to reach out and help the poor. Uh, tens of thousands lined the streets. So, what do, we find, what do we learn from Mueller? We learn the power of the gospel to turn around a playboy, self-indulgent life uh, to a life of significance for the gospel. Uh, we learn the power of a simple family Bible study and inviting somebody to a, a prayer meeting as evangelistic tools. We see the necessity of, uh, of good works and deeds in the, in the Christian life. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but we're not saved by a faith that is alone, and that faith gets busy in serving the Lord. We also clearly see that the Lord will provide, and we see the power of God, uh, or sorry, the power of prayer, in seeking the Lord's provision. I think maybe that's maybe one of the big lessons. How much do we deny ourselves and how much trouble do we uh, needlessly bear all because we do not carry everything to Him in prayer? There is a, there is a great God out there with uh, great uh, resources and great potential to supply all that we need to do. So, we do well to remember these people of the past. George Muller, rubber of the cruel streets, goes down in history as a great testimony to the power of the gospel. Okay, that's, uh, that's him. We're on to the intimations now for today, and they are on the bulletin that I emailed out to most of you um, yesterday. Just to draw attention to one or two things, you know the pr procedures well enough, and uh, as I've been saying it regularly, but if you do find that you're struggling at some point with the mask, then please don't be embarrassed just to take a wee step out through the foyer outside, get some fresh air and come back if you can, and don't want you to sit feeling totally uh, uncomfortable because of, the, because of the masks on, because we know it's not ideal. But uh, nevertheless, it's good to be here uh, within these parameters that we presently face. Sunday school is continuing through with Anne in the room today. I wasn't, um, I wasn't just knocked down in the stampede of volunteers stepping up to, uh, to help with that last week. So I've got somebody for next week, but if anybody else was able to take a turn maybe once a month or six weeks or so, then we'd be very pleased to hear from you. Um, then through this week, the prayer update will be issued on Wednesday. Uh, as usual, services next Sunday will be at 11 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. You know how that works and how to, how to book and so on. Um, advanced notice for the deacons and for the elders. Also notice there of the Albert Church's Youth Trust AGM later in the month. And just a, a simple note that the Blythewood Shoebox Appeal will be happening this year. Um, don't, we've ordered the leaflets to come, so they'll be coming probably through the course of this week. And we'll uh, figure out how we can get these to you. Um, but, uh, but that will be happening, so probably quite good to be thinking about how to, how to support that in the reasonably near future. <clears throat> so finally, just, uh, I thought it would be quite good just to mention that um, you guys are mostly all here, mostly in the morning, and you're, you're not at the moment seeing the guys who are the people who are coming in the evening. Um, so I thought you might be interested to know that the numbers that we're expecting today, inc including the, um, the children through in the um, the wee room through there. We were expecting about 35 today. I think it's maybe slightly less than that, but so a, a number in the low 30s this morning, and we're expecting 29 this evening. So both services are generally on fairly full, and uh, most of the people that you're not seeing are here uh, in the evening, and, and the other ones who have not come back yet, we are in contact with. We do, we do know who they are. I can't say we know where they live, but, but we're, we're, uh, we are in touch and we're, we're looking forward to the time when, when they'll feel able to come back as well. But we are aware it's not ideal at the moment and uh, so we're not able to see everybody in, in the usual way. But you have the directory, which is a wee bit out of date now, so we might reissue that um, and uh, folk can be in touch with others because uh, it's good to just be able to do that. Okay, these are all of the intimations uh, for today. So we come to our prayers of intercession now. And I thought, do you remember on Wednesday it was mentioned in the prayer notes that uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators announced this week that the Bible has now been translated into its 700th 
language in the world uh, today. So that is quite amazing. And I thought, therefore, it would be good to pray for word ministry, including Bible translation, in our prayers of intercession today. So let us bow together before God. Almighty God, we do thank you and praise you for your word, uh, which we have found to be a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. Lord, we pray, give us not just an appreciation for your word, but a commitment to it, to know it, to treasure it, to proclaim it, and like men like George Muller and his wife in the past, to, to live it out and to, to live in light of it, O oh Lord. Hear us then as we pray for the ministry of that word. We ask for the, the ongoing work of Bible translation, Lord, as we, as we give thanks for this translation milestone that has been passed in these recent days. We pray for Wycliffe Bible translators and others as well involved in bringing your word to peoples who as yet still do not have the Scripture in their own language. Bless that work. We pray, O oh Lord, uh, enable the linguistic and cultural difficulties that, that translators face to be overcome. Lord, give the power of your word into the hands and into the hearts of many who have never had that privilege. And we pray too for the work of Bible promotion and distribution and placement. We remember the Scottish Bible Society and all that they do to uh, promote and encourage Bible reading and awareness. We remember the Gideons, Lord, asking that doors would continue to be open for Bibles to be in hotels and universities and oil rigs and schools and football clubs and elsewhere, and asking, Lord, that these Bibles wouldn't just sit in drawers but would be found and, and read and engaged with and would be leading uh, people to Christ in these days. We pray too for Scripture Union and all their ongoing work to engage, especially with the young, through camps and missions and through the, 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 the daily Bible reading notes that they produce. Lord, we pray for ministry training. We uphold the work of ETS as they come near to the start of a, a new academic year. We ask your blessing upon staff and students together, uh, asking that uh, both academic excellence and spiritual devotion would produce a, a generation of ministers ready to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. And we remember too Edinburgh Bible College and its work under John Brand there, asking that young people would be prepared for ministry through this as well. We pray, Lord, for the actual preaching and teaching of your word, that the pulpits of, of our land uh, and in these pulpits, the Word of God would be proclaimed boldly and fearlessly and with no compromise or holding back. Lord, that your voice would in this way be heard by the people of God and that the people of God would in turn be uh, enabled and emboldened to serve Christ faithfully in daily life and in this way further proclaim the living Word, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we remember that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, and that these same Scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation, Lord, then deepen our own affection for and adherence to Your Word. Hear us further. As we remember before You, our own immediate context and those who may be suffering or struggling through hard or testing or perplexing times, those who are ill uh, or who are in need of uh, medical attention, those who are maybe awaiting the results of tests, those, Lord, who are concerned for family members just now, those living under the cloud of bereavement, those, Lord, who are suffering from loneliness, and, Lord, those who suffer uh, in, a, a, in a way of spirit or of mind rather than of body. Lord, you are the God of all compassion. You know us. Uh, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know what we need before we even ask. And so we lay all those before you who are in need in these times and ask you to draw near and for your still small voice of calm to speak in the ear and in the heart of all those who are in such need. Hear our prayer, Lord. Hear our prayer and draw near to us now as we open up your word together. All this we ask is in Jesus' strong name. Amen. So we're turning once again this morning to the New Testament and to Paul's letter to the Colossians, and we will continue our studies there. Colossians chapter 1, the verses are 24 to 29. I 
once you get into the letters, it's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and that's the way it goes. If you get to, uh, you get to 1 Thessalonians, you've gone too far, turn back, uh, and you will get back to Colossians. So we're in chapter 1, verses 24 to 29, where Paul writes, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of His body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the Word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints." To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim Him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all His energy, which so powerfully works in me. Amen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. So, we're thinking about the ministry of Christ from this uh, interesting uh, passage of the, of the letter. We're thinking about ministry today. By, by way of introduction, this uh, this. Um, Describing itself as the ultimate chain letter, apparently, appeared in a number of Church of England uh, parish newsletters a few years ago. And it said this, if you are unhappy with your vicar, <laughs> sure you can't imagine such a thing, but if you are unhappy with your vicar, simply have your church wardens send a copy of this letter to other churches who are tired of their vicar. Then bundle up your vicar and send him to the church at the top of the list in this letter. Within one week, you will receive 16,435 vicars, and one of them should be all right. Have faith in this chain letter for vicars, it says. Do not break the chain. One church did and got their old vicar back. <laughs> well, the ministry is an oft-lampooned profession, of course, hopefully most of it good-natured. And while it certainly ought not to be regarded as being above constructive criticism, it is, of course, under God, a high calling. That's to say that the, the calling is a high one, not that, not that those called are any higher than anyone else. Thomas Carlyle has that, that famous quotation, who, having been called to be a preacher, would stoop to be a king. And that reflects something of the awesome privilege and solemn responsibility of declaring the unsearchable riches of Christ from all of the Scripture. Now, all of that is by way of introducing the subject of the ministry of Christ. Last time, in that sublime passage, verses 15 to 20, we saw the supremacy of Christ in both creation and redemption, and we saw the sufficiency of Christ in the gospel. And now Paul is referring to his own ministry. Well, with such a, a supreme king and head of the, of the universe and of the church, it is essential, isn't it, further to be a ministry through which his name may be exalted and his ways and his word may be proclaimed. In verse 23, at the end of the passage last time, Paul had described himself as a servant of the gospel. And, and here in verse 25, he describes himself as a servant of the church. And these are really two dimensions of the same ministry. He's, he serves the gospel, he serves the church. By serving the gospel, he serves the church. And of course, the, his, his service of the church must be done according to the gospel. Paul, as we have seen, felt great affection towards the Colossians, though he had never met them in person. But the driving force of his ministry to them through this letter was the gospel. Anything else is not only unfaithful to God, it is damaging to the church. The gospel itself must drive all 
the ministry that goes on in the church. And so, as Paul describes his own apostolic ministry, he provides a real benchmark for all Christian ministry. And we see his commitment to this ministry, his commission for it, and his goal in it and through the ministry. That's the, that's the three points that we're coming on to now. The first of these that I just said there was Paul's commitment uh, to this ministry, which we see in verse 24. And that commitment is to follow in the way of Christ. Now, verse 24 is one of the most difficult and one of the most debated verses in Colossians. What does Paul mean by saying or, or by referring to what is still lacking in regard to Christ's sufferings? But, but one thing this should clearly do, this verse, one thing it should clearly do is dispel any idea that the Christian ministry may be regarded as prestigious, glamorous, or easy. It's about commitment despite suffering for the cause. And actually, it's beyond that. It's even about suffering, not just suffering despite uh, not just, sorry, it's even about rejoicing, not just rejoicing despite the suffering, but rejoicing in it, rejoicing because of it, and because of the recognition of the uh, achievement of that suffering. It's not a kind of, a kind of sanctified masochism to, to rejoice in the suffering. It is about seeing the bigger picture where the church very often benefits through the sacrifice and suffering of her servants. And that's why Paul can say that he can rejoice in his suffering, because it blesses the church. That's, that's real gospel thinking, real big picture thinking from Paul. Uh, and, he, and he says this kind of thing. Philippians 1, he writes of how his chains, that's his suffering, his chains have advanced the gospel, and so he can therefore rejoice. In 2 Corinthians 11, with that amazing, incredible catalog of imprisonment, flogging, beatings, shipwrecks, persecution, betrayal, hunger, thirst, and, and other things in there as well. And Paul describes how it was, it was that suffering, enduring all of that, that had brought the gospel into Asia. The gospel often, if not always, spreads through hardships, through, through opposition, through persecution. Remember the case of Stephen? Even through martyrdom. You remember that when Stephen was martyred, all the believers were scattered all through Judea and Samaria. And we observed a couple of years ago, looking in Acts, that the gospel was scattered with them. The gospel was scattered as widely as the, as the believers were scattered. And, th and this is not just first century church life. It's an abiding principle. The missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, another one of these great famous Christians uh, who have gone before us. Hudson Taylor was impressed, uh, quotes, by the fact that every important advance in the development of the mission had sprung from or been directly connected with times of sickness or suffering which had cast him in a special way upon God. So that's the commitment Paul is talking about here. Commitment to the gospel, to, to declare it and abide by it and, 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 and uh, proclaim it faithfully regardless of the cost, and a, a, a corresponding commitment to the church, and to be prepared to endure all kinds of hardship for it. In the, some of the Christian newspapers and websites I read, um, you see adverts for ministry conferences, and they're all about attaining excellence in ministry, in preaching, in counseling and so on. I don't remember, and that's all good and necessary, of course, but I don't remember ever seeing a conference uh, advertise itself as offer, offering training in how to endure suffering and to rejoice in the way that that suffering can, uh, can build up the church. I wonder how many, how many delegates would sign in and book up to go to that conference. <laughs> but that's the principle that Paul lays out here. Paul's suffering blesses the church. He goes further, though, and shows that his suffering identifies him with Christ. And this is where we need to grapple with what he means by this expression, what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. What in the world does Paul mean by that? Well, we can certainly say this with confidence. Whatever Paul means by that, he clearly does not mean 
that there is anything lacking in Christ's atoning suffering on the cross. Because that would not only set this verse against the rest of the New Testament, it would set it against what Paul has just said in the immediately preceding verses about the supremacy of Christ, not just in creation, but in redemption. No, it's a, it's a full, final, and perfect sacrifice that Jesus offers. It is a full salvation that saves to the uttermost that He accomplishes. And Christ is, as, as Paul just said in verses 18 to 21, supreme in redemption. His sacrifice is sufficient for the salvation of sinners. There is no sense at all in which Paul or anybody else, for that matter, can add to what Christ has accomplished at the cross. It is well said that the only contribution that we make to the cross is the sin that makes it necessary. So, what then is Paul doing? Well, I think what he is doing is linking Christ and His church in the economy of salvation and in the workings of God, in the ministry of Christ, because the ministry of Christ and the ministry of the church should be uh, the same thing. As Christ suffered, so too will His church. He Himself said as much when He defined discipleship as self-denial and cross-carrying, and when He said that the world would hate us just as it hates Him. It was, of course, as we know, through Christ's suffering that uh, salvation was accomplished. And isn't it so often through the church's struggles and suffering that this same salvation is proclaimed and souls are won for the gospel? It's surely as we enter into the, this willingness to suffer for the souls of the lost that we become most like Jesus himself, because that's precisely what He did for us. He came, and there's a principle of Christian work, if you like, there. He came and suffered for the benefit of the lost, and that is what He calls His church to do, to come and to suffer for the benefit of the lost. To engage in the ministry of Christ is to follow in the way of Christ, is to have a willingness to enter into this pattern of we sometimes put it like this, this pattern of cross before crown. The crown is up there, the crown is out there, but it's achieved, it's received through the cross. So, Paul, Paul says that his suffering identifies him with Christ. He is going in the way of Christ. I, I think um, there, there's, a, there's an episode from the life of the mission, missionary Helen Rosevier that many of you will have read about and you may have seen in, uh, uh, and heard in the Keswick Convention. Helen Rosevier, who died in 2016, served more than 20 years in the Congo with WEC, the Worldwide Evangelization Crusade, and, and there was a revolution in that country in 1964. Uh, that overwhelmed the country. And she and her co-workers endured months of brutality. You could, you could hardly even bring yourself to say uh, publicly the things that that poor woman suffered. Um, and once when she was on the verge of being executed by their captors, a 17-year-old student came to her defense and was savagely, savagely beaten uh, for his trouble. And for a moment, she, she was a very honest uh, lady, and she says, for a moment, she felt like God had forsaken her. But God, she says, God somehow clearly said to her, 20 years ago, you asked me for the privilege of being a missionary, the privilege of being identified with me. And then this, this is what's so relevant for our matter here. These are not your sufferings. These are my sufferings. That was what she perceived Christ said to her. These are not your sufferings. These are my sufferings. And she says, as the force of that hit home, she was overcome with the sense of privilege, uh, her sense of identification with Christ, of union with Him was elevated. And she said she was even able to rejoice in the captivity uh, that she was in. And she, she had suffered worse than that, uh, than that boy had done herself. The fact is, from the cross onwards, there is not much that is accomplished in Christ's church without a struggle. It's in our struggles, it's through our struggles that the kingdom is built. And further, 
It's through our, and this is what we see in, in, in Roosevelt's case, it's through our struggles that we grow in dependence upon God and that we become more like Jesus. So it's not grin and bear it. Uh, it's not cheer up, things can only get better. It is to, to recognize through the severity of the trials that God has Christ-exalting, kingdom-building purpose through all that His people are called to endure. It's a profound message, one that cannot be trotted off lightly or flippantly because of the cost of it, but one that must be declared faithfully. Uh, that it is the way of Christ, and it is the way He calls His children to follow. And part of what drove Paul through all of this suffering was his commission his commission to preach the Word of God in all of its fullness. I have become the church's servant by the commission of God, uh, the commission God gave me, rather, to, to present to you the Word of God in its fullness. Let me tell you, when you're up against it, you need to know that you have God's commission. You need to know that you have God's call uh, to, to, to keep going and to persevere through the tough stuff. And Paul, Paul was, uh, was in no doubt about this. There was the Damascus Road which was uh, something certainly that he would never forget when God turned his life around and began to reveal his call upon Paul's life. And then there was Paul's time, uh, maybe up to three years in Arabia uh, by himself, perhaps under the, the direct, probably under the direct um, instruction of Christ in some way, during which time he established the gospel fully in his mind and saw how Christ was taught in all of the Scriptures, the Scriptures which Paul the Pharisee, of course, had known extensively all his life, but, but then realized he'd never actually understood until Christ revealed himself in all of them. Paul, Paul didn't make up his gospel that he proclaimed, as he says to the Galatians. Uh, it was uh, God revealed the gospel to Paul. God commissioned him to preach it. Similarly, th those who are called to preach today have no liberty to just make up their own message, no liberty to say what they like uh, about the, uh, the issues of that. I, I once had that in a, in a previous congregation. A person said, I really don't like this thing that you do of going chapter by chapter and verse by verse. I'd be much more interested to hear what you have to say about the things that were on the news this week. <laughs> so, so I said, well, I don't think you'll be getting that anytime soon, really. Or at least what you might get is what the, what the Lord says if, if it comes up in the, in the ministry of the Word. But no, there is, there is no liberty for the, for the preacher just to go and do his own thing. It's about a commission. It's about a calling from God. The, the situation is, as Donald Coggan, one time Archbishop of Canterbury, once uh, put it, the Christian preacher has a boundary set for him. When he enters the pulpit, he is not an entirely free man. There is a very real sense in which it may be said of him that the Almighty has set him his bounds that he shall not pass. He is not at liberty to invent or choose his message. It has been committed to him, and it is for him to declare, expound, and commend it to his hearers. And then Coggin said this. I've always thought this was a wonderful thing. It is a great thing to come under the magnificent tyranny of the gospel. And uh, uh, those who preach know exactly what that means. It is a magnificent tyranny. You're not allowed to go beyond what it says there. You've got to work. You've got to, get to, the, uh, got to get to grips with your passage. Uh, but it is magnificent. Uh, there's nothing else like it. So, what is that message? We're talking about this, uh, this message that Paul has given to uh, proclaim and to declare. Well, the message is progressively revealed over the next few um, uh, verses, although it's not going to be a surprise because the previous section really told us what the, what the message is all about. But it's, uh, it's put forward in terms of a mystery, the mystery that had been hidden for ages and generations. Now, we need to comment on the, on the, the use there of the word mystery. Mystery religions were very popular in the ancient world, as they still are today, actually. Um, secrets revealed only to initiates who enter through private ceremonies and elaborate rituals and that sort of thing still floats the boat of some people, even today. 
And, and in terms of the term mystery, we usually think of the term mystery as referring to concealed truths that you can't quite get at. So, so in, a, in a murder mystery like uh, Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express or Death in the Nile or, or some of these great novels, uh, it's, it's an impenetrable mystery until super sleuth Hercule Poirot comes along and uh, lines them all up at the end, you know, and then uh, reveals who done it in, a, in an amazing feat of uh, detecting. Uh, but, but what the Bible means by mystery is, is something a bit different. Um, what Paul's talking about here is truth revealed by God. Truth revealed by God. Something that is undiscoverable by mere human investigation but is known through divine revelation. And so in the Bible, mysteries are not preserved, they are revealed, progressively revealed for sure, but, 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 but revealed nevertheless. Truth is not concealed among the elite, it is disclosed openly and freely for anyone and everyone. And this mystery is the gospel of Christ, the good news of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And Paul says that was kept hidden for ages and generations. And, well, the reader of the Old Testament certainly discovers that as God's salvation purposes are gradually revealed through the types and shadows of the law and the prophets. So there's the Exodus that records God's deliverance in part. There's the law that reveals God's standard, but also sin. There's the ark and then the temple that contains God's presence, but keeps the people at a distance. There's the throne that promises a reign of justice and righteousness, but then can never quite deliver it. There are the prophets who foretell Messiah, but don't actually get to see him come. Only in Christ would all these foreshadowings of God's presence, God's deliverance, God's blessing, and God's Messiah be revealed and received. And so, therefore, Paul can say at <clears throat> the end of verse 26 that the mystery is now disclosed to the saints. Why is that? It is because Christ came came in the redeeming power extolled in the preceding section to reconcile us to God through the sacrifice and through the suffering of the cross of Calvary. What was previously hidden or known only in part was now fully and openly revealed. The redemption that the Exodus delivered in part, well, Christ came and delivered that in full. What the law revealed in terms of man's shortcomings and sin, Christ overcame. What the temple provided in part, Christ provides in full. You remember how his death ripped the curtain in the temple in two. What the throne could never be, even under David, Christ achieves in his perfect reign at the Father's right hand. And what the prophets foretold, Christ has done. In Christ, God has revealed everything for life and salvation. All God's promises, yes and amen, in Christ. In the past, God spoke through the prophets, but now in these last days, He has spoken by His Son. Spoken by His Son. And Paul's progression of gospel thought continues. The mystery hidden for the ages, the mystery now disclosed. And Paul talks next of the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. <clears throat> there are scholars who think that the glorious riches of the mystery is the inclusion of the Gentiles in the gospel on an equal basis. And, and that certainly is a glorious gospel reality, but, <clears throat> but I don't see that as being what Paul has been building up to here. What it's all been building is this, Christ in you. Think about all that we, we said Christ has done and fulfilled, all that had been hidden, revealed in Him, and that Christ, that Christ who has done all of that, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And this is the, possess, the, the position of every believer. Remember, there are no first or second class Christians, only those who are in Christ and Christ is in them. Every believer in, is indwelt by Christ. Through faith, Christ is 
in you. And, and then really there are, there are not words that are big enough or grand enough to, to describe the blessing and the privilege uh, of all of this. Christ in you, that is, a, that is a present blessing. That's here and now, a present possession, bringing the, the blessings of the gospel right into us and into our lives. We, uh, the fact that we are ransomed and healed and restored and forgiven, who indeed like us, his praise may sing. So Christ in us, a present possession, and then the hope of glory. That is, a, that is a future thing. We're blessed now, but we don't yet have the fullness of this salvation of God. But we will. That's the, that's the glory of it. But we will. And while our present struggle goes on, we have this future hope to sustain us. Grace today, glory tomorrow. That's a win-win situation, isn't it? We have grace today for all that we face. We are promised glory tomorrow at the end of it all. That's a glorious enough thought, I think, for me. Such then is Paul's commission to preach the Word in its fullness. And that leads us on finally to Paul's goal. I was, um, I was defeated in my alliteration. I spent ages this week trying to think of a word for goal that begins with C, but it just wouldn't come. I was really cheesed off with that. But anyway, Paul's goal, uh, you get the idea, and it is to present everyone perfect in Christ. To present everyone perfect in Christ. So the ministry of Christ is not just sauntering along. It's not just a, a, a casual you know, if we can be bothered, kind of a, a thing. It is purposeful. It is urgent. It has a high aspiration. Paul says that he aims to present everyone perfect in Christ. Now, we should say that the Greek word uh, means mature or complete, uh, which gives us probably a better idea of what Paul is really driving at here. Mature or complete. He's not talking about sinless perfection. Don't go down that road. You can't achieve sinless perfection in this life. He is talking about spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. That's, that's where he is going. He is trying to produce spiritual maturity in God's people. He's talking about believers who have put their whole faith in Christ for salvation. Uh, Christ and Christ alone. And then to that have added goodness and knowledge and self-control and, and perseverance and godliness and, and all the things that Peter says in his letter. This is Paul's goal, that, that believers would, 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 would do that. Of course, we are. We are going to be complete and perfect in Christ in the end. Uh, but for Paul, uh, his idea is to produce mature believers. Uh, and, and, and how is he going to achieve that? First, by doing what he's been doing enough of already, by proclaiming Christ, he says there in verse 28. The message entrusted to the church is essentially Christ. The preacher can never exhaust the subject. The believer will never tire of the subject, and the church may never outgrow that subject. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, and He is everything in between. Our, our ministry and message is about faith in Christ. It's about union with Christ. It's about devotion to Christ. It's about security in Christ. We never go beyond uh, Christ. Uh, that would be regression, not progression. People are so keen to be understood, to be progressive today. Anytime you hear the word progressive, I would suggest uh, in public life in Britain today, you should think, think, you should think actually that sounds regressive to me because that's a, a good general rule, rule to abide by. And if we were ever to move beyond Christ, that would not be progression. It would be regression. And in fact, any church or ministry that fails to proclaim Christ fully and clearly at the heart of its ministry should really be sued under the Trades Descriptions Act, because by, by setting yourself up as a church, you set yourself up as a place where Christ is central, where Christ is proclaimed, where Christ is exalted. So, proclaiming Christ uh, is a fundamental part of this goal of Paul's, to present everyone perfect in Christ. Uh, and I suppose it's an aspect of proclaiming Christ that Paul identifies next, admonishing and teaching with all wisdom. Admonishing. Admonishing is a somewhat negative term, I suppose. Uh, it is to, to firmly correct 
errors in life and doctrine, and to urgently um, uh, war, uh, uh, warn rather, against unfaithfulness and disobedience. And such admonition is required in the life of the church. There, uh, today, as in the first century, there are many false ideas about Christ out there. So admonition uh, is necessary. It's the stuff that uh, you don't so often get thanked for, but it is part of the deal. And then teaching, uh, I think, is the more positive term. Instruction in Scripture, in doctrine, in godliness. Instruction in who Jesus is and in what it means to follow Him. And this all done with all wisdom. Again, emphasizing the divine origin of the gospel. It is the Scriptures themselves that are able to make us wise unto salvation, and the, the pastor-teacher certainly needs a godly wisdom to know how to present and apply the gospel message. And this is the thing, you know, that what we're doing right now, it's not just, it's not just designed to fill up an hour in your week. You know, there's nothing as, uh, as, as trivial or unimportant as that. There is definite spiritual purpose in this. Authentic ministry has the goal, and, and it's not just that, that I do this to you, but that we do this together as God's people. We have the goal of producing spiritually mature believers. And that doesn't happen overnight. You know, we don't become spiritually mature the day after we become converted. It's long-term work. Uh, and, and at the point of conversion, the believer has a long way to go, uh, much to learn. Growth in grace and godliness will always be necessary. And this is why it's so, so important for believers to be involved in and committed to a church where Christ is proclaimed and where the Bible is the center of all that is said and done. Sad to say, that is not universally the case. And in many churches, Christ is either ignored altogether or given what could realistically only be called lip service. But blessed will be the church where Christ is truly exalted and where He is indeed proclaimed from all the Scriptures. We should make no mistake, in many, other, in, in many churches, it's other things that hold the center ground and not Christ. But Paul's goal is presented here entirely in terms of word ministry, and its aim being the spiritual maturity of God's people. And you know what? Paul admitted that he found it hard going. He was laboring, and he was struggling in it all. As he says in verse 29, laboring shows that it is hard work, difficult, demanding, costly. It was no walk in the park for Paul, as you see in, in his reflections on his suffering. It remains the case today that such ministry as Paul envisages here can be difficult and demanding work. So there's labor and there are struggles. Struggling shows that this work often provokes hostility and opposition, not just from the world around us uh, in its sometimes apathy, sometimes enmity towards God and Christ and the gospel, but also, sadly, sometimes from within the church. It is laboring. It is struggling. It, is, it can be hard. It's, it's, it's recorded that, that D.L. Moody, well-known evangelist, uh, one night went to bed and uh, sat in his bed and prayed, Lord, I'm tired. Amen. <laughs> and fell asleep. You know, he was wiped out by the, by the day's ministry. That's not an invalid prayer by the way. That's okay. Uh, and there he was, uh, D.L. Moody, a well-known man, but, but knew the cost of it all. Finally, uh, which is the second time I've used that word, I think, today, but it will be the last, uh, Paul says that he is empowered by God. He is it's labor, it's struggle, but the power is supplied. Verse 29, Paul says, uh, with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. So, yes, it's demanding, but has God not promised to be with us and to supply all that we need? And does God not equip and empower us for everything that He called us to do for Him? And this is what must be always remembered and never forgotten in all Christian ministry. To try to engage in God's work without God's strength and enabling is like a tire-losing air really. You can keep going for a while, I suppose, but in the end, you'll end up flattened and in need of breakdown recovery. 
No, the work is God's and is to be done in God's way and by God's strength for the blessing of God's people and ultimately for God's glory. So, in closing, the preceding section told us that we have a great Redeemer, Christ Jesus our Lord, supreme in creation and redemption, whose sacrifice is sufficient to save to the uttermost all who have faith in Him. That being the case, it is necessary that there be this ministry of Christ, that what He did be carried on, that what He did be proclaimed, the gospel proclaimed, the Word of God presented, the church built up, believers presented as mature and uh, as complete. And yeah, there is a lot that is foreboding in the present time. There is the hostility of unbelief from outside in the world. There is confusion from false doctrine on the inside in the church. But Paul had all of that to contend with as well and proved faithful through it all. And the thing for us is the same power of the same God is available for us today. So, may we prove faithful in our day as we seek to continue the ministry of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we um, want to acknowledge that there is a great gospel. And so, therefore, Lord, we want to uh, acknowledge the importance and the need for the ministry of Christ, the ministry of that gospel to be uh, maintained, to be continued, to be expanded. Uh, Lord, forgive us that so much of what we think about and so much that, that occupies our our time and our efforts and our resources is, is passing and is this worldly, uh, and grant that we might understand these things aright and commit ourselves fully to the ministry of Christ. And may it be, O oh Lord, uh, that that great mystery that has been revealed through and in Christ, we might be the source of revealing it to many. Uh, work through us, O oh Lord, we pray. Whether it be through inviting somebody to a prayer meeting that, uh, that changed George Muller's life, or whatever it may be, give us boldness, give us courage, give us confidence in the gospel, uh, and give us faithfulness, we pray. For Jesus' sake, we ask it. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So we conclude then today with uh, these words from Psalm 25. The verses are 6 to 9. You are my Savior and my God all day. I hope in you alone. Please stand. We shall say these together. You are my Savior and my God all day. I hope in you alone. Remember, Lord, your love and grace which from past ages you have shown. Do not recall my sins of youth or my rebellious evil ways. Remember me in your great love, for you, O Lord, are good always. Because the Lord is just and good, He shows His paths to all who stray. He guides the meek in what is right and teaches them his holy way. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and always. Amen.